Another month of stories on Patreon and thank you so much for joining me for a month of shape-shifting stories. I can't wait to get started telling you about all these magical, mythical beasts that are out there. And you've probably heard of lots of them, you know, selkies, kelpies, fairies. There are many, many fairy folks that, uh, that shape-shift. And then, of course, there's the local legends like the shape-shifting dogs and cats and ghostly demonic animals. But the one that I want to tell you about today is the hair. Because we all love the hair. I think it holds a, a real place in our, in our hearts as a nation. They're quite elusive, mysterious. And they have the most beautiful faces with these amber eyes, enormous back legs. And if you've seen a hair, there's absolutely no mistaking that you saw a hair and not a rabbit, by the way. And uh, some of you will know that back before lockdown, I did uh, go out on a bit of a hare hunt at the beginning of March. And I would definitely recommend it because the feeling you get from seeing one of these magical animals is, well, yeah, go do it. So the story that I would like to tell you is called The Beekeeper and the Hare. Now, hares in folklore, uh, they're very much tied up with witches. And it it was thought that witches shapeshifted into hares. But this, this is a slightly different story. And like I say, it's called The Beekeeper and the Hare, and it hails from Scotland. There's a cottage not too far from here. Beautiful little cottage, you know, picturesque, stone, flint walls, beautifully neat thatched roof, roses and wisteria climbing up the outside, and the garden, the garden is alive with insects, and there are vegetable patches and wildflower borders. It's a busy place, because this is where the beekeeper lives. He's a very handsome man, and there are many women in the village who would like to marry him, but the beekeeper generally only has eyes for his bees. He talks to them each day, he nurtures them, and he rarely needs to smoke them from the hives, because they just seem to know what he wants them to do. It's like a symbiotic relationship. And the villagers, they hold the beekeeper very high in their respect and their thoughts for him because he he keeps the village fed because by looking after those bees they go off and they pollinate all the fruit trees they pollinate the farmers fields and of course they provide them with honey if they want a little sweetness in their tea and because this is a time when there wasn't any electricity the bees wax means that they can have candles they don't smell of melting animal fat like the tallow candles. So the villagers are very happy to have the beekeeper in their village. They leave him pretty much to himself. But you know, every day the beekeeper will go down to the market and he'll buy the provisions that he needs. And he'll have a chat about the bees and they'll ask him what's happening and how much honey there's going to be this year. The beekeeper nods and says, we'll see. And one day, the beekeeper is in his garden. He's tending to the hives. Like I say, he doesn't need to smoke them or, or do anything with them. He just needs to, to speak to them, respect the animals. That's what he does very well. And it is as he is looking out across the fields beside his cottage, a swaying, susurrating seas of barley, and down into the valley there's a little dark wood, where it is rumoured there is a witch who lives there. But the beekeeper doesn't mind that, he doesn't pay much attention to those rumours. No, because sometimes nature cannot be explained, and the beekeeper knows that. But as he is looking out from his garden, and he's looking out across the barley fields, from that wood, he hears a howling and a snarling and a slathering and it's getting closer and closer and closer and closer. 
and you can see the barley moving in a way that the wind doesn't move it. You can see something moving through the barley. You can't see what it is yet, but you can hear the feet of what can only be dogs. And they must be chasing something because dogs only sound like that when they're chasing something. And the beekeeper, he cannot abide hunting. And so when he sees above the barley two enormous brown ears, he knows the dogs have found a hare. And so he opens the gate as the ears get closer and the hare jumps in through the gates and up into his arms. And the beekeeper pushes the gate shut on the snarling, slathering dogs, which jump up at the gate and scratch at it and try to get to the hare. The bees, they sense the beekeeper's anxiety. They see the hare, a fellow animal, and they come to its aid. They swarm up into a ball, buzzing, annoyed, hissing, a thrumming sound from their wings. And they go over the fence and they sting those dogs and those dogs yelp and whimper and run off back into the barley. And the bees come back and they sit around the beekeeper who's still holding the hair and he can feel the heartbeat of the hair against his and he can feel her shaking. And he looks down at her. He looks down at her eyes. He sees they are brilliant green eyes never seen a hare with green eyes before. And he says to the bees, what do you think, bees? Do you think this hare has a place with us? This hare is a special hare. And the bees, well, they agree. And so the beekeeper places the hare gently back down on the path in the garden, thinking that the hare will probably go off into the garden somewhere and find itself some, somewhere to rest before it continues on its journey. But no, the hare hops up the path and to his front door, turns around and kicks it with one of her back legs. He laughs, for it's clear that she wants to come in. And so he lets the hare into the house and he feeds her the carrots that he's got at the market that morning and some water and lets her rest. And in the evening, he sits in the rocking chair and she sits up on his chest here and pushes her soft nose into his neck and the beekeeper tells her stories. Stories of nature, of the forest, of the sun, of the birds. Gentle stories. And it is over time that their companionship grows. This was the summer when the hare visited the beekeeper first and now we are getting on to the autumn. The leaves are falling from the trees. The ground is starting to get harder to farm. And each evening, as the nights draw in, the beekeeper and the hare sit in comfortable companionship beside the fire in the rocking chair. That is until there is a knock at the door. The beekeeper opens it. The hare is waiting just behind his foot to watch to see who it is. There is an old woman at the door. How can I help you, says the bait beekeeper. I'm afraid there is very little honey left. I have to save some of it for the bees for the winter. It's not honey I want, said the woman. I want to know how much you will give me for that hair. Oh, I'm sorry, said the beekeeper. The, the, hair, the hair is not for sale. I have gold. And the old woman pulls out a gold coin more gold than you have ever seen in your life. Well, this was true, but the beekeeper didn't really care for gold. No. What use was gold? So he said, no. This hair is not for sale, he said. Well, the woman, she became angry. She looked at him. She muttered a curse under her breath and she said, you will regret the day you refuse to sell that hair to me. That hair is mine and I will come for her. And with that, she disappeared. The beekeeper and the hare were, well, let us just say ruffled from their visitation from this woman. 
The hare was very frightened for quite a long time, but the beekeeper calmed her, soothed her, stroked her ears. And soon things were back the way they were, beside the fire in the rocking chair. And the next day, when the beekeeper went down to the market, he asked the farmers if they knew of this woman. They'd ever seen her before. No, none of them had but they all thought she was the witch that lived down in the wood, in the valley, the other side of the barley fields. <laughs> Don't be so silly, said the beekeeper. She's just an old woman, doesn't make her a witch. No, said the other farmers, beware, for at the Beltane, her strength will be at its highest. The Beltane night, when the liminal space between this world and the next is that little bit thinner and she can draw on that magic and you will have to take care. No one will take the hair from me, said the beekeeper. I will keep her safe. And so the seasons rolled on. They got through the winter. The beekeeper nurtured his bees so that they were ready for the spring. And once more the buds started to appear on the trees bulbs started to shoot through the ground and it was spring again. Soon came April and soon came Beltane night and the beekeeper really hadn't given it much more thought. He and the hare were quite happy. He had a new companion and his bees, well they loved the hare. The hare would help him in caring for the bees and the hare stand up on its hind legs and dance with the bees whilst he cleaned the hives. It was a happy life. And so when Beltane night came, it took him by surprise that he was just a little fearful of what may happen. The warnings of the farmers in the market rang in his ears. He knew what he must do. The moon rose high on the 30th of April, Beltane night. And as he and the hare were sat beside the fire, a huge wind started to whip up. The hurly-burly rattled the windows of the cottage and blew down the chimney in an unearthly, eldritch sound. He knew that the farmers had been right, for they worked the land as well and often they knew of unearthly things, and this was unearthly. The hare snuggled in tighter, shaking. He could feel her heartbeat once more and he held her tight. He was not letting go of the hare. And then the voice started. Give me the hare, the hare is mine. He would not do it. He held tight and tight and still the voice continued. She will come back to me. He would not have it. He held that hair tight and as the voice got louder and louder, the bees heard it outside and the bees knew that they must help. They must help the beekeeper and their newfound friend, the hare. And so they balled up into their swarm once more and up, up into the air, into the dark clouds and their mass was not affected by the tornado of wind and sound that rattled around the house and they went down into the chimney. They created a swarm around the beekeeper and the hare to protect them. The gentle buzzing soothed the hare and the beekeeper was grateful to his friends. Soon the voice started to whine. It did not like the bees. It could not get close to the hare or the beekeeper. And soon the voice went even at her most powerful, the witch had failed because of the love of the bees and the beekeeper. And as the wind settled and peace once more came to the house and the fire relit itself, the hare hopped down off the beekeeper's lap and there in front of the beekeeper the hare transformed into a beautiful, brown-haired, green-eyed maiden. 
Now the beekeeper knew that this hair had been special. This hair had been enslaved by the witch and a curse had been placed on her so that she may stay as a hare. But through his love and the love of his bees, she had been released from this curse. And of course, as these stories go, the hare maiden and the beekeeper were married. They lived a very happy life together, much to the chagrin of the other maidens in the village. And if they are not dead, well, then they are still alive now. I hope you enjoyed that story. I really love the way the bees, it really represents their self-sacrificing nature. Because, of course, bees will sting to protect the rest of their hive. And that's fatal for a bee, isn't it? So I think this really represents the magical nature of hares and that faithfulness of bees and brings them together in a beautiful love story. I think you'll agree. Anyway, like I say, I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you later in the month for more tales of shapeshifters. Doodle pip. <laughs>